Members of the National Police Force of Honduras reiterated their support for Constitutional President Alexia Mara Castro after the institutional crisis sparked in Congress. The United Kingdom's High Court has decided to allow Julian Assange to appeal to the Supreme Court in his fight against extradition to the United States. Soldiers in Burkina Faso led a coup on Monday, ousting President Rock Kabori and dissolving the government. From the headquarters of Teliso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South, and I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Honduras, where members of the National Police Force reiterated their support for Constitutional President Alexia Mara Castro after the institutional crisis sparked in Congress. The National Police issued an official statement recalling that they are a subordinate security body under the authority of the President, elected by popular vote. In accordance with the Honduran Constitution, the police force is a professional and apolitical institution with a purely civilian nature, responsible for the preservation of public order. In this sense, the force expressed its support to the President-elect and called on all other public forces to defend the will of the population as expressed in last November's elections. And we continue in Honduras, where in the midst of a political crisis which led to the election of two new boards of directors of the National Congress, the Council of Private Enterprise has called on the political forces in dispute to seek a solution through dialogue. The Council warned that the credibility of the political elite at a national and international level was deteriorating due to the political crisis stemming from a split in the Liberty and Reef Foundation Party. It called for unity as the only way for the country to overcome the crisis. The spirit of hope that the Honduran population has experienced since the November 28th election the landslide presidential victory of Siamara Castro has turned into discontent and repudiation at the acts of certain politicians just a few days before her inauguration as president. Cuban authorities confirmed the release of a doctor who had been kidnapped in Haiti. According to an official report by the Cuban Foreign Ministry, Dr. Daimara Pérez was kidnapped for 10 days. On her release, she was found to be in good health, as was confirmed by her family, whom she contacted as soon as she was freed. The doctor was on her way to the Notre Dame de Petit Gove Hospital when she was intercepted by armed individuals. Haiti is currently experiencing a wave of violence, with more than 1,000 kidnappings reported in 2021. In this regard, Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henry recently said insecurity and domestic terrorism are among the country's main burdens. Meanwhile, the political crisis has only heightened since the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse. Also in Haiti, the Minister of Commerce and Industry denied a possible increase in fuel prices shortly after huge demand was created at fuel pumps due to the rumour. Minister Ricardin Sanchin confirmed to national media that prices will remain unchanged while denouncing a deliberate campaign to spread misinformation. The minister reported that on Saturday a key terminal dispatched over 200,000 gallons of diesel, 6,500 of kerosene and more than 200,000 of gasoline, noting there was no shortage in the market. Haiti has suffered silical supply crises, the most acute occurred last September when armed gangs blocked fuel distribution. Mexico has seen the third murder of a journalist so far this year in one of the most dangerous countries in the world for the profession. According to statements from police at the crime scene, the body of journalist Lourdes Maldonado was found in her car with gunshots to the head near Las Villas in the city of Tijuana. Colleagues and relatives reported that the journalist had recently won a lawsuit against former governor of Baja California state, Jaime Bonilla, for overdue salary. In 2019, Maldonado asked President Andrés Manuel López Obrador for his help to resolve the issue during his daily morning news conference. Turning to Colombia now, where this year has begun with the murder of nine social leaders and at least eight massacres. According to human rights organizations, the South American nation records an average of one massacre every two days. 2022 began with struggles for territorial control between illegal armed groups scattered throughout the country. According to various organizations, the massacres and murders of social leaders in the first month of this year are a clear sign of the worsening of the violence. Leonardo Gonzalez, coordinator of the Institute for Development and Peace Studies, reported the recent murder of indigenous environmentalist leader Brenia Kuka Nama, noting that indigenous guard groups that protect and defend rights to different territories have become a target of armed groups.
The indefinite national strike of transport drivers in Guatemala continues with roadblocks established in several points of the country's 22 departments as a means to apply further pressure on the government. The initiative, promoted by the drivers of heavy urban and extra urban transport and taxis, seeks the repeal of the six-month extension of the obligatory obli contracting of insurance for damages to third parties. On Friday, the government of President Alejandro Giamatte signed the measure that prevents the protection of Guatemalan transporters. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Government assured that there is a protocol for this type of scenario and affirmed that the first resource of the executive will be dialogue with the parties. Meanwhile, the Transport Union and the National Coordinator of Transport disassociated themselves from the roadblocks. In Peru, the president of the Spanish company Repsol admitted to an error of perception regarding the magnitude of the oil spill off the country's coast on January 15th, stating that the company only noticed the impact of the environmental disaster the day after the event. During a televised interview, Repsol president Jaime Fernandez stated it was not until the following day that it was noticed that the spill was spreading along with sea currents. According to the Peruvian Environmental Evaluation and Control Agency, the extension of the affected area on beaches and coastline is 180 hectares and into the sea it is 713 hectares. Initially, Repsol stated that it was only a spill of seven gallons of oil. The Peruvian government is demanding compensation to finance the cleanup and address the environmental impacts. And we'll be right back after this very short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. On Monday, the United Kingdom's High Court decided to allow Julian Assange to appeal to the Supreme Court in his fight against extradition to the United States. The ruling follows a December decision by the same court to greenlight the U.S. appeal to extradite Assange, overturning an earlier decision that the Australian journalist could not be extradited to the U.S. due to his mental health and suicide risk. U.S. authorities have charged a 50-year-old under the Espionage Act for his role in publishing thousands of classified military diplomatic cables in 2010. If convicted, Assange faces up to 175 years in prison in a country that has already plotted his assassination. The United States and the United Kingdom withdrew diplomatic personnel and their families from Ukraine under the pretext of an imminent invasion by Russia. The move is part of the recent campaign by Western powers to create what Russia has denounced as a facade crisis and follows talks between US Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to de-escalate tensions in the region. The US State Department told the, the dependents of staffers at the US Embassy in Kiev that they must leave the country. It also said that non-essential embassy staff could leave Ukraine at government expense as a false creation of a Russian threat shows no signs of dying down. Moscow has repeatedly denied any inflation, invasion plan against Ukraine. And a Ukrainian foreign ministry spokesman said it was premature of the United States to evacuate the families of its diplomatic staff in Kiev due to fears of a supposed Russian invasion. Respecting the right of foreign states to ensure the security of their diplomatic missions, we consider such a step by the American side premature and a display of excessive caution. In fact, there have been no radical changes in the security situation recently. The threat of new waves of Russian aggression has remained constant since 2014, and the accumulation of Russian troops near the state border began in April last year. Cuban vaccine candidate against COVID-19 Mambisa is the first using nasal application to start clinical trials in the world, as announced by the Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. The developer of the drug reported via Twitter that the vaccine trials are advancing with recovered COVID patients and as a booster shot, and that so far the candidate has demonstrated safety and effectivity. The parameters were evaluated during the development of two phases of a randomized parallel group clinical trial applied in 120 adult volunteers recovered from the virus, the Institute 
reported. In phase one, three nasal delivery devices were compared, two of them in the form of a spray and one in the form of drops. The vaccine candidate was shown to be safe with only slight adverse reactions. Eduardo Martinez, president of the BioCuba Pharma Group, has assured that through nasal application, Mambisa could help cut off the transmission of the coronavirus. Cuba has surpassed 4 million citizens vaccinated with a booster dose against COVID-19, maintaining its leading position in the world in terms of vaccination against the virus and using its own vaccines. So far, Cuba has applied over 33 million doses using its own Soberano 2, Soberano Plus and Abdella shots, of which over 4.5 million correspond to booster doses. The Ministry of Public Health also reported that at least one first dose was administered to over 10.5 million and more than 9.3 million are fully vaccinated. For me, the vaccine has been a blessing because I got vaccinated already. I have never had a reaction. I have vaccinated my mother, who is 91 years old, my husband, who is 72 years old, my grandchildren, who are 6 and 12 years old, and none of them have had any reaction at all. Schools in India's financial hub Mumbai reopened as the country battles a surge in COVID infections. Schools in districts with lower levels of infection in India's richest state, Maharashtra, including in the financial capital, Mumbai, will come back students for in-person classes on Monday after they were shot when a new surge in coronavirus infection swept the country. The move has been welcomed by students eager to be back in face-to-face -face classes. We are facing this problem of, you know, lockdown and all that. And then we, uh, the school was reopened from 4th of November and then again shut down and then again reopening. So it's altogether a pleasure for all of us uh, to see the entire school running properly with 100% staff and the students. I'm happy because uh, we are having offline. So it's a good experience to uh, listen to teacher when she's in front of you and you are able to understand what she's teaching teaching in online classes we have the network issues and all so it's quite hard to understand the topic and clear the concepts in colombia the number of covid-19 related deaths continues to rise in its latest report the ministry of health confirmed 217 new deaths on sunday surpassing the almost 200 reported the day before the ministry also reported that the country has accumulated more than 100,000 deaths since the beginning of the pandemic and confirmed more than 5 million infections it also reported more than 20,000 new patients detected in the last 24 hours health authorities continue to insist on the implementation of biosecurity measures against covid-19 as variants like omicron which is the most prevalent in the country fuel a surge in cases And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Soldiers in Burkina Faso on Monday announced on state television that they had seized power, ousting President Wakabori, suspending the constitution, dissolving the government and the National Assembly, and closing the country's borders. A do not officer announcing the move, reading from a statement signed by Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry Sandaogo Damiba, said the new patriotic movement for preservation and restoration would re-establish constitutional order within a reasonable time, adding that a nationwide nightly curfew would be enforced. Early on Monday, African and Western powers announced what they called an attempted coup, and the European Union demanded the immediate release of the president. On Sunday, soldiers rose up at several army bases across Burkina Faso, which has been fighting an insurgency since 2015. They demanded the removal of military top brass and more resources to fight insurgents, but made no mention of seeking Kaboy's ouster. The president, in power since 2015 and re-elected in 2020, has faced rising public anger about the failure to stop the bloodshed in the poor landlocked country. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned the military takeover in Burkina Faso and urged the coup leaders to lay down their arms. I have a statement on the situation in Burkina Faso. The Secretary General is following developments in Burkina Faso with deep concern. He's particularly worried about the whereabouts and safety of President Rockmark Christian Cabore, as well as the worsening security situation following the coup carried out on January 23rd by sections of the armed forces. The Secretary General strongly condemns any attempted takeover of government by the force of arms.
He calls on the coup leaders to lay down their arms and to ensure the protection of the physical integrity of the president and of the institutions of Burkina Faso. The talks in Vienna, and Austria to revive the nuclear deal between Iran and world powers are progressing in the right direction, according to the Iranian foreign ministry. The agreement signed in 2015 granted Iran sanctions relief in exchange for curbs on its nuclear program. The United States unilaterally withdrew from the deal in 2018 under then-President Donald Trump, but President Joe Biden has signaled that he wants to negotiate a return to the deal. However, Iranian authorities have stressed that no concessions will be made and a return to the deal is conditional on the lifting of U.S. sanctions. If the United States is committed to past agreements, this human issue can be solved very quickly. What we are seeing in Vienna is that the talks are progressing in the right direction. Talks between the Taliban and Western diplomats are set to begin on the outskirts of the Norwegian capital Oslo on Monday. The session is part of a three-day meeting that began on Sunday with talks between the militant group and civil society representatives, being the first such encounter in Europe since the Taliban regained control of Afghanistan five months ago. Western nations represented at the meeting include the United States, the European Union, Britain, France, Germany and Italy, as well as the Norwegian hosts. The U.S. State Department said its delegation aimed to discuss a range of issues including humanitarian aid, human rights, security, education for women and girls and the formation of a representative political system. Afghanistan has been cut off from financial aid since the Taliban returned to power, which has aggravated the social and economic crisis a Central Asian country faces after 20 years of war and foreign occupation. And dozens of demonstrators gathered in Oslo to protest against the arrival of a Taliban delegation, the first to visit Europe since the group returned to power in Afghanistan. Talks began with a focus on human rights with Afghan civil society members in the Norwegian capital, ahead of highly anticipated meetings with Western officials. The Norwegian, the Norwegian government has invited Taliban here to Norway. We Afghans think this is to laugh in the face of all the people from Afghanistan who have lost family members over there. How can they invite terrorists who have killed so many people to sit down and talk about peace? You do not talk to terrorists. We are here to say no to Taliban, no to terrorists. I am already disappointed that my government, my politicians, Norwegian politicians, the Labour Party, can invite terrorists to our country. Among the people invited is Anas Hakini, who is still on the U.S. terrorist blacklist, meaning they are known all over the world as terrorists. They are invited to our country and served cake and coffee. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesoenglish.net. You can also follow us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Daily So English, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching.